relatively sudden demands for braking and acceleration. 175 mile an hour straightaways I mean a driver has to have a lot of confidence in his tires. Thereby increasing the odds 
but they'll be around for the finish. Of course, there's some luck involved. Not being at the wrong place at the wrong time. And keeping away the gremlins that chew up engines and transmissions. A rule of thumb for endurance racing. It doesn't pay to go for broke and break it.
pit crew now has its hands full as the number four car heads for new right side rubber, fuel, and driver's change. The problem with 44's engine is a broken push rod. It's replaced and the engine reassembled. The four car is fitted with its night air dam. next hour of racing will see the number four TR8 move into first place in the GTO class and fourth overall. The 44 car has lost some ground, but five hours of racing still remain, and anything could happen. Co-driver Bill Adams takes the wheel. The car, now literally taped together at the seams, heads back into the competition. Changing colors, deepening shadows, imagery in motion, yet still the savagery of competition. Darkness, punctuated by the piercing beams of light, and softer glowing reds. Left time slow by a few seconds. The course becomes hard to follow as cars overdrive their headlights.
axle and elects to stay in the driver's seat for the remainder of the race. The four car cools down quickly in the night air and oil thrown from the engine is removed. 10.45. 15 minutes of racing remain. The gremlins are still at work as cars die all along the track. The ruling speed of this race has claimed its victims. The four car is readied for the finish. The guard prepares for the final laps. The four car leaves the pits for the last time. Both cars are now on the course after almost 12 hours, over 1,000 miles, and they're still running in the top 20 overall on Goodyear Eagle NCT Street Tires. The final seconds of the race are last. Both cars have taken the checkered flag. and overcome numerous mechanical problems. Two TRA racers equipped with Eagle NCT street tires shaved to racing depth almost performed a miracle at Sebring. They finished 10th and 20th on street radial tires. At one point, expectations were even higher. The number 44 car had to overcome the bent axle and broken foot rod, costing Tullius and Adam any chance of victory. The number four car was leading the GTO class and running seventh overall when transmission and cooling system problems cost the car its lead and dropped it to a 20th place finish overall. Leo Mal said it best. The important thing to us in racing the Eagle NCT street tires at Sebring was to demonstrate the kind of performance of which they're capable. Leading the GTO class and running seventh overall at the three-quarter mark. It's just unbelievable for a street tire. There was never any question that Goodyear Eagle racing tires were the fastest tires at Sebring. The winning entry, the 935 Turbo Porsche piloted by Bruce Levin, Curly Haywood, and Al Holbert, ran on Goodyear Racing Eagles, as did the other top 40 qualifiers. The 10th place finish for the number 44 car was the highest place finisher of all the street tire entries. Other manufacturers entered street tires, but none came close to Goodyear's Eagle NCT. The two cars combined used just 18 tires to complete two 1,054 miles of racing for reaching speeds of over 170 miles per hour on the straights. At Sebring, the evolution hit its peak. The Goodyear's family of racing tires and high-performance street radials proving once again why Goodyear has earned the reputation of being the number one tire company worldwide. Sebring belongs to the Eagles. You know, I spend a lot of time on racetracks of one kind and another. Today, this one's deserted, except for a single car and a single driver involved in a special test session. I think it's a pretty good place to begin to tell their story, because they're a pretty special pair. In fact, I think you could call them two of a kind.
nearly two decades now, this race driver named Bob Cooley. But his passion for victory is as strong as ever. He's raced many kinds of cars on a multitude of tracks, but his special challenge lies within the unique brand of North American competition called the Trans Am. series of road racing events intended to bring American-made sporting machinery like Corvettes and Camaros into competition with European GT cars like Porsches and Jaguars. It's a series with a long and dramatic history, including such heroic names as Mark Donahue, Dan Gurney, Peter Revson, and Parnelli Jones, as well as the man who won at Sebring in the spring of 1966, the first Trans Am ever, Bob Tullius. star, but he carries the scars of a hectic youth. Ironically, they did not come on a racetrack. Does the leg bother you? Not at all, Brock. Uh, some of my competitors think it's my big speed secret. <laughs> <laughs> some extra lead in there. Yeah, something. something along those lines. <laughs> it's ironic. 18 years of racing, and as I understand it, you hurt the leg twice uh, away from a racetrack. Playing football. I had a budding uh, professional football career a number of years ago and was being looked at by the Colts. And then uh, in Bangkok, Thailand, I got run over by a taxi cab, no less. So uh, it's had its troubles, but it doesn't slow me down much. I started out uh, doing the drag race scene in the country road just like all the rest of us did, I think, Brock. And, and uh, one night, a buddy of mine were leaving a signal light that was just close to my home, and uh, we had to pass by my mother's window. She never, um, she never had seen me race before or since, actually. But uh, she was one of these mothers who never went to sleep until all the brood was at home. And uh, she was lying awake uh, reading. So we went by the window flat out in second gear and giving it all we could. And uh, in those days, it was flex tubing and straight pipes. And um, uh, the next morning, it was very quiet at breakfast until uh, she finally couldn't stand any longer and she said, who won? <laughs> who did I get that from, though? Your father. Of course. <laughs> he used to say, she used to say my father had a gasoline fanny. You could hear him all over, uh, uh, 20 miles away coming with his 32 Essex with no muffler on it. Racing is no rich man's hobby for him. This is a profession, full time, seven days a week. Trip 44. Hello, oh, Mike Dale. How are you? His shop in a small Virginia town is a classic racing operation. Surgically clean, self-contained, completely equipped, and manned by professionals like himself. Bob, well, as I understand, it started in 1961. Where, how, what kind of a car? It was a Triumph TR3 in the driveway of my house in Alexandria, Virginia, Brock. And uh, it's come a long way since then. When did you really start to get serious about motor racing? Brian Firstenau and I met each other in 1963, and though I had been serious about it for a couple of years before that, he sort of accelerated that process, and then when Lanky Fouché came along a little later, we developed the nucleus of what is now Group 44, and we're very proud and very pleased about it. Like all successful racing operations, Tullius Group 44 team spends a great deal of time in private test sessions. Tullius contends his team has the skill to make a winner out of almost any type car, which he has successfully done with his XJS, a coupe that gives away several hundred pounds of weight and over 100 cubic inches of engine displacement to much of its competition.
before the day ends, I will make a few more laps under the somewhat uncertain control of a completely new driver. If you can look over there on your right, you see uh, a whole bunch of switches, half of which I'm not sure what they are, but the three on the right are essential. Okay. The first one is the fuel, the second one this is one? Yeah. Yeah. The second one is the diff pump, and the third one is the water cooling for the brakes. Okay. So you won't really need the water cooling for the brakes, but the other two might be of some value too. Pedals are in the standard places, uh, right to go, left clutch, and stop in the middle. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. If I crash, I'm going to remember. Oh, okay. You want your hat? Okay, okay. I'm got your hat. Um, I know you've driven some Trans Am cars in your time. In fact, I saw you coming somewhere uh, out of MIS out of a big mud puddle with polywogs <laughs> dangling out of your ears. But, yeah, one of my moments. But um, you'll, uh, you'll be surprised. It's too bad that you, uh, we don't have the time for you to take it out and really wring it out, get used to it, and get a good feel of it because you probably, uh, you'd be excited about it. Yeah. I'll give it a whirl, right? Um, Bob Pressure should read what? Oh, it'll be all right. Okay. Don't worry about it. Um, okay. Up on the chrome, chrome one.